Okay, so I've known for a long time that there are a thousand ways to refute Pascal's wager, but I only learned last week that one of those refutations is Pascal. So now we've obviously talked about Pascal's wager a lot on the show, and most of the time we shorthand it to, but what if you're wrong, right? And that does accurately portray the gist of the argument, and it does correlate more closely with the form of the argument that you're most likely to encounter in your day-to-day life. But that reduction is a bit of a disservice to Blaise Pascal, right? It's, it's kind of a shame that we really know him for this shit apologetic because Blaise Pascal was a brilliant thinker right? to the point that if you were putting together the brief history of math, he's almost certainly going to get a mention. By the age of 16, he was publishing revolutionary treatises on conic sections and projective geometry. While he was still a teenager, he started building a mechanical device to help his dad in his job as a tax collector, making him one of the two claimants for the title of guy who invented the fucking calculator. He made contributions to the study of probability, fluid dynamics, and vacuums that are important on like a a historical scale. And of course, his most important mathematical contribution was a bear with me, tabular presentation of binomial coefficients that we now call Pascal's triangle. Now, look, I don't know what a binomial coefficient is, so I don't want to pretend to fully grasp Pascal's contribution to math here, but I know enough to say it's really fucking important. His was one of those rare brains that had the capacity to actually broaden our understanding of the world. He could invent knowledge, and he did. He had a really prolific period in his teens and his 20s, and then he stopped. And to understand why, you have to take a deep look at Pascal's wager. So as I've hinted, the actual formulation Pascal offered up is a bit more sophisticated than what if you're wrong. What he was setting out to do was to prove the existence of God mathematically, or barring that, at least prove that we should act as though God exists. And this came from a place of genuine fear. See, among the things that Pascal had done was challenge this long-held Aristotelian concept about vacuums, and in so doing, he was one of the first people that really called Aristotle's worldview into question. Now, that was a problem because that worldview was the one officially endorsed by the Catholic Church. All their proofs of God were based on the idea that we lived in Aristotle's universe, and we didn't, and Blaise Pascal was one of the first people to see that we didn't. Now, luckily for him, he was born a little bit before the Vatican realized that they were going to need to burn people at the stake over this kind of thing. So his revelations weren't really interpreted as a threat by the state, but they were treated as a threat by Pascal himself. His brain was sharp enough to glimpse atheism even in the 1600s, and that scared the shit out of him. So he tried to call in math to save his ass. So the trick in Pascal's wager is that the reward for accepting Jesus is described by Christians as infinite, right? So any number times infinity is infinity. So even if the chance of God existing is zero point the billion zeros one, the reward for taking that chance is still infinite. And of course, at the same time, any probability times zero is zero. And the reward, at least the posthumous one for atheism, is zero. So no matter how likely it is, you're better off betting against it. The odds are zero to infinity. Now, This is a trick. This is a manipulation of the fuzzy ends of the numeric spectrum to achieve a desired result. And it falls apart the instant you account for things like other religions, but you don't have to go that far. See, the reason Pascal stopped contributing to the world of science and mathematics actually was a bad bet on the wager that we named after him. The story is that he had a religious experience in 1654 and he converted to this sect of Catholicism called Jansenism and he decided to devote himself to Jesus instead of advancing knowledge. Right now, it doesn't take much imagination to consider that a really smart, really devout guy took a look at mortality and decided that he was done with all this objectively considering the universe shit too. But regardless of the actual reason, the result is that he stopped contributing to science. He stopped doing any useful thing, and he did theology instead. And the future was robbed of whatever genius was still locked away in that remarkable brain. It's even worse than that, actually, because Pascal also died really young. He was only 39 when he died. And even by the standard of the time, a low-level aristocrat like himself could have expected a significantly longer life. But his branch of Christianity embraced suffering. So he refused any advice or assistance from his doctors. And instead, he told them that the sickness was, you know, the natural state for a Christian. And I mean, look, given the 
quality of doctors at the time. There's no way to know whether that killed him or spared him a couple of years, but there's no question that the reasoning was shit. And look, you, you might even be inclined to think we didn't miss much, right? Like maybe Pascal had already thought of all his best thoughts and maybe his religious conversion was just a really convenient way of not disappointing all the people that were still waiting for his winds of winter or whatever. And, and, and that if he'd ever had an important insight after that, maybe he would have just deconverted long enough to share it. But even that unlikely excuse is demonstrably false because the work that he did, the, the Pascal's triangle thing, again, the work generally accepted as his most important contribution to math came during that period and he wrote it down and he never published it because he was afraid that science and knowledge would lead people to stray from God's path. It was only published posthumously. And there are a lot of really likely scenarios you can imagine where we just never would have found it. It would have been lost to the world. Again, I don't know enough about math to know how much that would have cost us, but we're not talking about multiplying by zero here. And that's the thing. See, religion likes to talk about the infinite afterlife to distract you from all the shit they're taking from your actual finite life. Sure, may maybe you and I aren't going to revolutionize binomials or whatever, but we're still granted only the hours we have. There's no set of infinite do-overs in the cloud. And when you stop and you truly grasp and accept that fact, you realize that every single one of those hours has an infinite value. 